this is Tommy Rowe, and you're listening to Pavlina's Kids Place. Hey everyone, this is Pavlina from Pavlina's Kids Place, and I'm on location at Epcot as part of the uh, Flower Power concert series with the iconic pop rock singer and songwriter Tommy Rowe. Hello. Thank you, Pavlina. Hello to you. So how are you doing? I'm doing great. I just finished the show, so you can yeah. see I'm kind of wet here from, <laughs> from the heat, but uh, I'm doing great. We had a great show. Yeah, it was. It was really great. I, I watched it. So you performed all over uh, the world and stuff, but have you ever performed at Epcot? Epcot? You know, it's a funny story. I was the first act to ever perform here at Epcot really? when it opened. Oh they were, in yeah. fact, when I performed here, they had just finished the Contemporary Hotel, mm -hmm. I think it's called. Yeah. And I was staying in there, and they were still working on the park. There was construction going all around, and they had a little theater in the round just down on the bottom, a glass kind of enclosure. Yeah. And I performed in there. Wow. That's and that cool. was in 1970, I think it was, or 71. Wow. That's so cool. Yeah. Awesome. So, and then are, are there any other space, uh, like places that you like to hit? Well, I've traveled all over the world. You know, I've worked in England a lot, Germany. I've been to Asia, Malaysia, Singapore, Thailand, mm -hmm. all of these places. So, um, you know, it's fun traveling in different countries and performing. And it's amazing. You don't realize sometimes your fan base, how far yeah. it reaches, especially with the technology we have today. I mean, it's a smaller and smaller world, so we're reaching a lot more people. Yeah, definitely. That must be really cool. Yeah. So I heard you were one of the first bubblegum artists, which I think is pretty cool. But what I is I was the king of bubblegum. This is your the king of bubblegum. Yes. Actually, I started bubblegum. And it's interesting how that happened because in the early 60s, you know, American acts kind of dominated the charts over here. When the Beatles came along, not only did the Beatles become superstars, but a lot of the other British acts came to America and did very well. They pushed a lot of the American acts off the charts. So I had to come up with something different to sustain myself through the 60s. So I started mm -hmm. writing these bubblegum. I called them soft rock songs. Yeah. And the DJ started calling it bubblegum. And it really caught on. And I really think that's how I was able to have so many hits during the 60s with all the British invasion that was going on because I was able to write those songs. Yeah, definitely. That must be really cool, though. That's awesome. So songwriting has always been really important to you. When did you start songwriting? And um, when, you, when your songs made the radio, was that like a really big shock for you? Oh, the first time I heard it, I was uh, just in heaven, you know, oh, it's yeah. fantastic, yeah. you know. And I wrote Sheila when I was 14 years old, and originally the song was I, how I started. I wrote these little poems, and I wrote this poem by a little girl I had a crush on in school, mm -hmm. and her name was Frida. And it's yeah. like, sweet little Frida, you know, if you see her, blue eyes and a ponytail. And about the same time, my dad taught me three chords on the guitar, and I thought, you know, maybe I'll try to put some music to my poems, and you know, maybe I can become a songwriter. Yeah. So I did that, and, and then I had an audition with a uh, record producer, and I, I sang Frida for him. He loved the song, but he said, we got to come up with another title. It's not commercial. So yeah. we changed the title to Sheila, and that was my first hit. Awesome. That is so cool, though. Awesome. So as a kid, did you know that you always wanted to have music as a career someday? I think by the time I was uh, in my early teens, you know, 14, mm -hmm. my dad played guitar, my mom played p piano, and my dad taught me to play the guitar, and I, I just fell in love with it, you know. Yeah. And I remember watching Rick Nelson on TV back in those days when I was still in high school, and it seemed like he always had a lot of girls around him. Yeah. And I yeah. thought, man, if I could do that, I'll have a lot of girlfriends too. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> it's kind of cute, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Awesome, that's great. So growing up, kids have all kinds of obstacles. What kind of obstacles did you have and how did you overcome or deal with it? Obstacles? Um, I think in show business there's always uh, little trials along the way that you have to overcome and you have to, you have to make the proper choices. Yeah. And nobody always makes the right choice. And I made a lot of poor choices in my career in the early days. But you learn from your mistakes and you carry on and you uh, make it better f yeah. from, from your mistakes. And that's kind of how I've always looked at show business. And so this is my 55th year, so I must be doing something right. <laughs> awesome. That's great. <laughs> that's really cool, though. So um, you're, how, like, how did you get a lot of airplay and stuff? Because I remember when I talked to Helen Reddy, um, she said that you know she used to have different voices. Like she would come up with different voices, um, and they would like recommend her song, or she'd have friends recommend her song. Uh, airplay was always the first, when, as, as a songwriter, the first thing you had to sell was the DJ. Mm -hmm. And because in, in our time, when we made, we just made single records, we didn't make yeah. albums. And so when I wrote a song, I was really writing first to please the DJ. Mm -hmm. Then I figured, well, once I get, get the G DJ to like this song, he's got to sell it to the public. Yeah. So it's got to be commercial. So that was the attitude I had about writing songs. And DJs, uh, when, I were, when I was recording, I mean, you had to have the DJs on your side. Mm -hmm. 
So we would do hops for them. They used to call them hops. You'd go sing your song at one of their dances at the radio station. They'd sponsor a show, mm -hmm. and you'd show up and, and do a song or two, you know, for the, for the DJs. So um, that's kind of how we did it. And, you know, I've met a lot of great DJs. Along. In fact, the DJ is the one that got me into Nashville to record Sheila, the first, uh, the first hit I had. Wow. Yeah. That's cool. Awesome. Paul Drew was his name. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. That's so cool. So um, if you had a choice of being a singer um, with number one hits today or back in the 1960s, which one would you choose and why? All the time, number ones. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no choice there. Always number ones, no matter where you are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I, I, had my, I had two number ones in the 60s, uh, yeah. Sheila and Dizzy, and Dizzy was my biggest record. And then um, I've had six top ten records in Billboard and 16 or 17 top 30 records in Billboard. Yeah. So I've had my share. And uh, today, it's the, record, it's not, the record business is not like it used to be when I was doing it. Today, it's not so much the single anymore. It's the album and it's the video and it's a whole different kind of thing. And the technology, I, I call technology the star now. The yeah. star is the technology. Everybody loves technology. Yeah. So you got to use it to your advantage, make it work for you. And a lot, I think a lot of the young entertainers have it made today because they can make their own music at home and they can actually publish it and put it out themselves which is yeah. really incredible I mean we were never never able to do that when I was a kid so yeah, it's pretty cool what mm -hmm. you're doing today yeah definitely because I know YouTube is a huge thing with everyone huge. everyone sees YouTube. everybody loves so, it yeah yeah awesome that's great so you wrote like you said um, and recorded six top ten songs during the 1960s did you have a favorite you know, my hits are kind of like my children. <laughs> some of them are naughty, some of them are nice, and they ch change sometimes. But I think probably my favorite one to sing is Sweet Pea and Dizzy, probably. Really? Yeah, those two are a lot of fun. People seem to really, when I start singing Sweet Pea, it puts an, a smile on the audience face. Yeah. And I love to see those smiles when I start singing that song. It's great. Mm -hmm. the, um, Sweet, Pea, Sweet Pea is actually my favorite song. Oh, cool. Yeah, and I was like, when I was cool. um, looking up all of your stuff, I like I know all the words now. Oh, that's so, so cool. So yeah, it was really cool. Thank and it was you. also my grandmother's favorite song. Oh, that's so great. that was nice. So um what was like who's like the most fun to perform with while on tour? Mm, boy, I've worked with a lot of artists. You know, I've worked yeah. with the Beach Boys, the Beatles of course, I toured with them in England. Uh <clears throat> I met Elvis several times. I never had a chance to work with Elvis, but um loved him. Um I guess probably the most interesting thing was working with the Beatles because um, th when I worked with them, they were, they were a featured act on my tour. They, yeah. Nobody knew who the Beatles were in the early 63, and I went to England, did this tour, and uh, they were a supporting act for our tour. And during our tour is wh where they really launched their career because mm -hmm. they really started developing their fan, fan base around England as we traveled around the country. So that was an exciting time because after that tour, I knew they were going to be big. I never dreamed they'd be as big as they became, yeah. but I knew they were going to be, do very well in the record business. And then, of course, about six months to a year later, they came to America and they did yeah. as the Beatles we, we mm -hmm. know today. And when they came in, uh, first, their first trip to America, they did the Ed Sullivan Show. And then the next day, they had a show down in Washington, D.C. at the Wa Washington Coliseum. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, their manager got in touch with my manager and asked me if I would open for them at that show, which, oh <laughs> which I did. Yeah. I went to Washington, D.C. and opened the show for the Beatles at their first concert in America. Wow, that must have been like, kind of weird to like have them. It was them. cool. The one thing I remember, it was so hectic because the Beatles created such pandemonium, was all the people in the audience were throwing jelly beans. Jelly beans. Jelly really? beans. And, man, you'd get hit with these jelly beans, <laughs> and it's like, wow, what is that? Where's, and they were all over the stage, and they were throwing jelly beans. It was... It was something the Beatles, one of the Beatles said in an interview or something, they asked, what kind of American candy do you like? And they said jelly beans. Oh, and so the okay. people picked up on it, and they just, the audience came with a bag full of jelly beans and started oh throwing them. <laughs> That's crazy. That's yeah. so funny, though. Um, so I know earlier you talked about the British invasion, but, like, what did it do, um, especially, you know, kind of changing a lot of the artists? Because you said that it kind of pushed them out. It did. Well... Uh, American artists had to either establish a style that wasn't competitive with the British yeah. style because they had this band thing. All, the, all of them were groups. They were all bands. And uh, the American artists at the time were single acts. And mm -hmm. they, didn't, they weren't like uh, so-and-so in the band, you know. Yeah. 
So uh, the ones that were able to create a, a sound of their own that didn't conflict with the British sound were able to have hits in the charts. But it wasn't easy. And um, the British invasion, they had some great acts come over here, very competitive, and you really had to be on your toes to compete with them. And so I was very fortunate to coast right through there with my hits and be very successful. Definitely. That's awesome. That's really yeah. great, though. So, um, like I told you a little bit before the interview, my uncle has had this record, you know, since it, like, came out. This record? Yes. That's it. <laughs> An oldie but a goodie. <laughs> yes. So, um, and you know, he's probably had it for 40 or 50 years. Yeah. So, what do you remember about this album the most? Taking these pictures on the front. Oh, really? Uh, all of these little Tommy Rose down here. There's tw It's called 12 in a row. Mm -hmm. And there's 12 Tommy Rose there. It's a like, clever little idea. Yeah. And so, I had to take a different pose for every one of those in that suit. And it was very hot that day. And I thought it'd never end. And the, photo the, photogra the photographer was very picky. Oh, really? And he said, oh, that's great. Oh, no, we've got to do another one. We've got to do another one. So, I mean, every one of those 12, we probably did 112 oh takes. <laughs> so yeah. that's, that's kind of what I remember that. But uh, this was my biggest album. It has all the hits on it. And this, is all, this same album is also out on CD. It's oh. called The Greatest Hits. Yeah. And it's the exact same album. Awesome. That's really great, though. Yeah. So cool. So um, you're in a lot of Hall of Fames, and I know some of your fans are trying to get you into the Rock of World Hall of Fame. So what do they need to do to make that happen, and how long do you think it's going to take? I think, uh, you know, I don't know. I think a lot of artists have been overlooked in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, especially the early artists, the uh, 50s and 60s artists, and a lot of the 70s and 80s artists as well. So 20 I, minutes wait, I, 20 minutes till show. They're talking to us. <laughs> So I think uh, what what you need to do is get a petition, you know, like uh, petition the Hall of Fame and say, you know, you'd like Tommy Rowe to be in the Hall of Fame. That will help. And I think uh, just talk it up. I mean, that's what you have to do. Get your fan base working and make it happen. It's a, it's a little political, the Hall of Fame, but, you know, everything's political these yeah. days. You've got to play the game. And, and uh, the fans are the, really the ones that decide. I mean, if you get yeah. enough fans asking to be in the Hall of Fame, it'll happen eventually. Mm -hmm. Hope it happens not posthumously. <laughs> yes, definitely. So go out and tell people about it. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yes. So what are your upcoming plans and events? Uh, we've got uh, some dates coming up in Michigan in uh, next month, and uh, we have a lot of dates booked in the fall already. Casinos. We do a lot of casinos across okay. the country, and um, so I'm looking forward to it. You know, I retired in 2005. I, I just uh, kind of got tired of traveling around. You know, was, you know, I did it for a long time, and. Um, so I hung it up for a few years, and then my band leader talked me into coming back out, and mm -hmm. we did three dates up in Canada, and I kind of got the bug again. Yeah, yeah. So here I am after three years after Canada, and we're doing more dates every year. Yeah. So hopefully we'll be in your neighborhood. Yes, definitely. That's awesome. Well, I'm glad you um, you know did come back to it. So, uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you so much for talking Thank to you, me. Thank you, Pavel. It's my pleasure. Dizzy.